and verse 14. <coughs> Proverbs 11, verse 14. Where no counsel is, the people fall. But in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. Father, bless your word now, we ask in Jesus' name, and amen. amen. Proverbs eleven fourteen: where no counsel is, the people fall. But in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. Uh, we've been talking about finding the Lord's will. And we've gone over several things that you want to try to go by when you're trying to find God's will in any kind of matter in your life. We went over the fact that uh, uh, we went over the fact that uh, it's of course the Word of God, you know. But sometimes I mean, there's sometimes there's not a specific verse that says, "Thou shall go here on the 25th of November," you know, or whatever. There, there's no. So sometimes there's not really a specific verse of scripture to back up what you're trying to find in everyday life I'm talking about. Like there's no, if a person's trying to pray about going to the mission field, there's no verse that says, Steve Kogel, it's my will for you, thou shall go to Africa on next year, you know, or whatever. So, so the word of God, we do need to, use, need to use the word of God, but sometimes just not the word of God. There's also uh, the peace of God. And I've heard some preachers say they think that's the biggest one because you can you can get a verse of scripture for about anything, and you can the circumstances can be looking like that God wants you to do this particular thing or go to this particular place or whatever it is. So you might have the circumstances in the Word of God, but do you have peace in your heart about it? That might be that, that might be a red light there and say no no no, but you think you might have the circumstances, all right? The circumstances and the uh, word of God and uh, and the uh, peace of God. The peace of God, I've heard some preachers say they think that's the number one thing, is the peace of God about the particular thing. But uh, I think you have to have all these things. So uh, how does God reveal his will to the seeking individual? Sometimes the Lord guides by the advice of other people. Right here, Proverbs 11, 14, about different counselors. All right, getting advice. This is a great verse, by the way, Proverbs 11, 14. Where no counsel is, the people fall, but in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. All right? So, you know, a, a, a good leader will get several heads, several minds in his decision, in his or her decision. A good president will get, you know, call for, I mean, he don't get 10,000 people. You know, he don't get every, every single human being. But he gets some different people that's got some wisdom on some different things. Like if he's going to get ready to go to war, or he's getting ready to attack or bomb some country, he's getting ready to do that. He wants to get several generals that know about war and got some brains about the thing. All right? And so, uh, and same with a, a pastor, a leader, uh, a corporate businessman, uh, you know, that owns some corporations or, you know, he's going to go into business doing this or that. Sometimes you want to get some different, uh, some different people's beliefs and different uh, viewpoints and opinions about should I do this? You think I ought to go this route or that route? Should I do this or that? Different counselors. Proverbs eleven fourteen. Where no counsel is, the people fall. But in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. In most of the decisions that we make, if we don't get no counsel, we fall usually. Now, some, not all the time, but a lot of times. Now, some people get counsel, but they don't take that counsel. They go against it, and then it's a mess, usually. All right, so... Uh, Sometimes the Lord guides by the advice of other people. You've got to be careful. Sometimes people give you advice and it's way off. You know, it's not really. It's their own, it's their own fleshy desires. It's their will. You know, it's not really, they're not really looking at it from God's standpoint. All right, they want you to do what they want you to do what they want you to do. You know. So you just gotta be careful. Uh, sometimes God reveals his will along with the word of God through opportunity. What kind of opportunities are there? Circumstances. The wishes of parents, the, the advice of friends, the evaluation of one's own ability, you know, uh, personal inclination, the needs for the day, the conscience, the peace of God in your heart about it, how are the circumstances, and you really can't go on the circumstances because a lot of times the circumstances look good and right, but it might not be God's will, 
A lot of times circumstances don't look very good, but it is the will of God. If some of those old-time missionaries went on the circumstances, they had never gone to the mission field that they were going to because it looked like it was just everything was against them. All right, so yes, really it takes a close walk with the Lord. And uh, it's very unsafe for any person to sit down in prayer, answer a small voice and get up and say, God's leading me to do this and that. All right, because, I mean, even though God does speak through a still small voice, the devil can speak to you or your own flesh. See, your flesh wants to do this or that. All right. Uh, uh, so you got, you, got to be, you got to be careful about these things. All right. Before making big decisions, it's wise to ask not only your parents, but your friends and your enemies and uh, your pastor. Uh, I've had a few of you folks here, here some of you folks here in, uh, in the church. I'm not going to go into detail about stuff, but uh, you have come to me the 13 years that I've been here. Uh, some of you have come to me about different decisions in your life, about pertaining to different things, and just ask me my opinion about it. And I, I would always tell you that uh, those of you that have come to me about certain things, I would always tell you that really, I can't really make that decision for you, but if you want my opinion, this is what I would do. Or this is what I wouldn't do. And uh, so, you know, just for what it's worth. Sometimes your enemies can give better advice than your friends because they know your faults better. George Mueller was a great man of God who lived many years ago and who accomplished things through prayer that perhaps no other person ever accomplished. Uh, I don't have the exact statistics available on George Mueller's work in the orphanage at Bristol. All right. But George Mueller was an amazing man in that he never asked anybody to send him any letters. He never asked anybody to send him any prayer requests, nor did he get their addresses to try to get any money out of them. All right. He ran orphanages. He had to feed children every day. He just get down and pray three or four hours a day. And people, people out of the blue would just start bringing food and sitting on the front steps and the front uh, doorway and to feed the, the children. He never said a word to anybody. And uh, very few people do that today. Uh, but George Mueller raised more than $4 million in American money and supported more than 2,000 orphans in a lifetime, feeding them three meals a day and sent out more than a million dollars to foreign missions. How did he do it? He did it simply through prayer without once publicizing his work or putting out circulars about his work or putting out bulletins or letters about his work and without once telling anybody about his needs. What's really neat about that, what, it's, there's, uh, now, you know, we, like we come to you, you know, say, you know, you want to give the project fund, you know, pay for the air conditioning. We got other projects around here we want to do and everything. And, uh, but that's different. We're talking about a church-wide thing. We're talking about personal, your personal needs and things like that. You know what's really neat is when you have a need and you don't tell nobody. I mean, you don't tell nobody. And you pray about it and watch God meet that need. That is an amazing thing. You, 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 I'll tell you what, it, it, we already know God's on his throne and he answered prayer, but that'll really show you and manifest the fact that God is on his throne and he sees you and loves you and knows your prayers and hears your prayers when you pray like that. But we have a tendency, we all do it. We all do it. It's our flesh. We all have a tendency to maybe get pass a few hints to somebody, you know, or, you know, I need this, or, you know, I th th this happened or this happened or whatever. And, uh, you know, we're hoping that they provide that need. But if you don't tell nobody, sometimes you have to tell people. I understand that. There's things in life that, you know, you have to mention it some, to somebody. But, you know, certain things you just don't tell nobody and God meets the need. All right, he prayed in the money. Not once did he say, send in for this, you know, whatever, send in for this plate or send in for this olive leaf from the Mount of Olives or send in for this piece of wood for the table of the Last Supper, you know, the different gimmicks that they have, these television preachers and radio preachers. George Mueller prayed in over $4 million in American money Raised, uh, raised over 2,000 orphans who never missed a meal. Brought them up, raised them up. 
and put a million dollars in the mission field or 25% of his income. Don't you think it'd be wise to ask George Bueller what his formula was for finding the will of God? All right, we're going to ask him, Brother Bueller, what is your formula for finding guidance? Here's his answers. Number one, he said, surrender your will. Have no definite choice in the matter. Lay yourself at God's disposal. Surrender your will to God. Number two, seek the Holy Spirit's will through God's word, the King James Bible. George Bueller never used or read or worked with any other Bible in his lifetime than the King James Bible, which he called God's word. Number three, he said, note providential circumstances. Note providential circumstances. And number four, he said, pray for guidance. And then number five, he said, wait on God. Now, that's the hard thing to do, waiting on God. All right? I've had, I've had that problem since I got saved. I mean, 47 years. I mean, I want, when I pray about something, I want God to do it yesterday yeah. or last month or year. And uh, sometimes he does things pretty quick. Sometimes, a lot of times he doesn't. F.B. Meyer, a great preacher, once wrote these words. He said, when the word of God, the impulse of the Holy Spirit in my heart, and the outward circumstances are in harmony, then I am convinced that I am acting in accordance with the will of God. F.B. Meyer said this. When the word of God, which we've already talked about, the impulse of the Holy Spirit in my heart, talking about the peace of God in your heart, and the outward circumstances are in harmony, then I am convinced that I am acting in accordance with the will of God. But sometimes there might be one or two of those things that are not, but it is God's will. You just have to really pray about the thing. Uh, the first item is when the word of God is in harmony with the other two. Where you don't have the Word of God and you can find the Word of God to the original manuscripts, which nobody's ever seen, nobody's got, then they're not in line with the Word of God. All right? So, uh, so th these, are, these are just some of the things. Uh, but a lot of these, uh, both of these men, F.B. Meyer and George Mueller, both of them say that the absolute essential for finding the will of God is to study God's word and make sure it is in line with what you're about to do. If you don't have God's word, the Holy Bible, uh, you're in trouble or you, you have no map. Guidance is often a combination of several factors. Psalms 32, 8, God said that he would guide us with his eye. I will guide thee with mine eye, Psalms 32, 8. We're talking, folks, about a God, a being that knows everything about the past, present, and future. So God can look out a, a, month, a month ahead. He can look out a week ahead, a month ahead. He can look down the road six months, a year, two or three, four, five years, 10 years, 20 years. He can see 100 years, 500 years down the road. Aren't you glad you're saved? You got God on your side. Yeah, amen. So that's, that's what you got to consider when you consider the will of God. So, uh, you only need light for one step at a time. Above all, obey the light that God has given, already given you, and then he will give you further light. Don't reject light from the word because it contradicts, contradicts what you've been taught or what you feel. <laughs> Never reject light from the word because it overrules your prejudices or makes you feel humble or upsets some of your theological convictions. Light rejected becomes lightning. Light rejected becomes like when God reveals stuff to you and you obey it and you adhere to it, God will give you more light. And then you accept that and receive that, he'll give you more light and more light. That's why there's some Christians that are farther advanced in the Christian life and in the word of God than others. Just to be plain about it. Uh... There's no way to discover the will of God. That's one of the main ways. There might be some other things involved, but there's no way to discover the will of God by rejecting light from the Bible. Remember that God wants to give you both the master plan and the minute details of your life. So patiently wait on him. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. 
Isaiah 40, 31. I got a message I preached on. I think I preached it here years ago on eagles. I think I did. Uh, never go back on guidance. The eagle, by the way, is a very interesting creature. Amen. Never go back on guidance. Never perform autopsies on guidance. That is, having put your hand to the plow, don't look back. Luke 9, 62. No man, Jesus said, having putting his hand to the plow, looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Or as Paul said, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. Philippians 3.13. So we need to start seeking light from the word of God and obey the light that God gives you. The right road leads out at the right place. Or as a famous preacher once said, the best preparation for tomorrow is to do what you ought to do today. The best preparation for tomorrow is to do what you ought to do today. Uh, I used to tell people... Uh, when our kids all fought and our kids were young and uh, I was either pastoring or we were going to a church or whatever. I mean, we've, you know, all of our kids were raised in church. Every time the doors open, we're in church or whatever, whatever the church was doing, whatever. And uh, uh, of course, my wife would have to get out all their clothes, you know, and all that and shoes and socks and clothes and everything for, for uh, church Sunday. And I, I, I learned through the years, primarily by watching my wife, because she's the one that mostly did it for our kids, our five kids, as far as the, the best preparation for Sunday morning is Saturday night. Mm -hmm. Woo! So how did you find that out? Found that out through lots of stuff. I mean, I mean, we'd get up Sunday morning and my wife, even then, even then my wife would lay stuff out. I don't know if the devil carried it away or what. We couldn't find half the stuff. <laughs> Amen. Amen. But the best preparation for Sunday morning, I usually tell people it's got cute children in this, you know, small children. Best preparation for Sunday, really anybody. The best preparation for Sunday morning is Saturday night before you go to bed. Because the devil will make sure Sunday morning you can't find this. I thought I laid this there. I thought I laid that. Where is it? I put that there. Where is it? Not, uh, you'll spend 25 minutes looking for one little object. It's amazing. All right. Uh, finding, the Lord's, finding the Lord's will. Now I want to talk to you about a little bit about prayer. We're getting ready to start revival. And... Uh, uh, I want you to turn, if you would, to 2 Corinthians 1. I want you to look at this verse. I mean, there's so many verses about prayer. I mean, we'd be here all night. But I want you to see something that Paul said to these Corinthian Christians when he was in trouble. He thought he was going to die. 2 Corinthians 1. But look what he says to them. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. And really... That goes for anything. It's not just going to church Sunday morning, you know, getting stuff laid out Saturday night. It's, it's anything you got to do, especially early the next morning. The best preparation for that is the night before. Amen. Getting things all ready to go for in the morning. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Look there if you would. 2 Corinthians 1 verse 5. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. Whether we be afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effectual and enduring in the same sufferings, which we also suffer. Whether we be comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. All right? See, the reason why a lot of you folks go through some of the things you're going through is verse 4. Who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. So he says there that the reason why sometimes we go through trouble is so we can comfort those that are in any trouble. Now Paul's going to talk to us about the trouble that he got into in Asia on his missionary trip. Look there at verse 7. And our hope of you is steadfast, knowing that as ye are partakers of the sufferings, so shall ye be also of the consolation. For we would not, brethren, verse 8, here it is. For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble, 
which came to us in Asia. Now, he doesn't tell us specifically what that is, but he, he goes on in the verse and basically says he thought he was going to die. All right, so I don't know if that was because he was taken prisoner, he was almost drowned, he, you know, shipwrecked, he was, I mean, I don't know. But here he says, our trouble, which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure, above strength, insomuch that we despaired even of life. He was pressed out of measure above, above his physical strength, above, above more than what he thought he was able to handle physically within himself. All right? In so much we despaired even of life. Verse 9, but we had the sentence of death in ourselves. He thought he was going to die. That we should not trust in ourselves, but in God, which raiseth the dead, who delivered us from so great a death. He, so God delivered him and doth deliver in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us. Now watch verse 11. Ye also helping together by prayer for us. You see that? He says, you helped us by your prayers. Now folks, when you get down to pray, don't th the devil will tell you your prayers don't matter. And God's going to do whatever he's going to do anyways. Don't, you don't need to pray. You're wasting your time. The Lord's going to do what he's going to do anyway, so why are you taking your time praying about? Those are all tricks of the devil in your mind to stop you from praying. Man. Yep. Pray without ceasing, 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. Uh, I mean, there's so many. Uh, Colossians 4, 2, continue in prayer. Uh, you have not because you ask not, James 4, 2. James 5, 16, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. That's why the devil fights you so much about prayer. He tells you, 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 you don't have time to pray. You got to do this, you got to do that, you got to call so and so, you got to go over and pay this bill, you got to run over here, you got to call them, you got to do this, you got to run over and do this, you got to go by and do this, you got to do that, you got to do this, you got to do that, you got to do this. If you want to be reminded of all the things you got to do, just get down and pray. Amen. And the devil will remind you. And because uh, he don't want you praying, it's a spiritual battle. He don't want you, he don't want your nose in the Bible. Pray, uh, reading and studying the Word of God, and he don't want you praying. Because those are your two weapons, the Word of God and prayer. All right? So uh, that's what the devil will do. Now, uh, the element that is missing from today's Christianity is straight, hard preaching of sound doctrine. That is, the doctrinal emphasis is gone altogether a lot. And what you're getting today in the last 40 years on radio and television from morning to night is a soft, practical, devotional, spiritualized sort of leavened, watered-down slop that is humanism. The entire emphasis has been your relationship to the Lord and the Lord's relationship to you personally, which is great and wonderful. This personal, devotional, psychological, spiritualized, leavened thing is popular because it never crosses anybody's brain on what they believe. All right, so that in other words, what we're saying is they basically most of your radio and television preachers avoid doctrine. All right, it's usually a spiritualized, devotionalized, taking a verse, if they even use a verse, if they even use it, most of them don't even use the King James Bible. So it's kind of a watered-down humanistic slop fest. Slop fest. And that's why a lot of Christians are very shallow in America today. And uh, when they go to church. A lot of the churches, if, they, if the guy's a halfway Bible believer, basically what they hear is salvation, uh, bring your tithe, and that Jesus is coming back and be good. That's usually what they hear Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night for 50 years. All right? There's really not no getting into the Bible and really teaching. They, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't teach verse by verse if their soul depended on it. Because yeah. when you teach verse by verse, you've got to cover things that A lot of times people don't want to hear. And uh, prayer is speaking or talking with the Lord Jesus Christ. Prayer is an offering up of our desires to God for all things lawful and needful with humble confidence that we shall obtain them through the mediation and merits of Jesus Christ. Dr. H.W. Uh, Frost said prayer is worship addressed to the Father in the name of Jesus Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, prayer should consist of at least four parts. Prayer should con consist of at least four parts. Number one is adoration. 
Number two is confession. Number three is thanksgiving. And number four is supplication. Number one, prayer should consist of at least four parts. Number one, adoration. Prayer should be the act of the soul worshiping and praising God. According to Psalms 95, verse 6. Number two, confession. Repentance from every known sin and confession of sin. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Thirdly is thanksgiving. Be thankful for anything, be thankful for everything. Philippians 4, 6. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Whatever what request you have, you let it be known unto God. You say, well, he already knows. He might already know, but he wants you to talk to him. Yeah. See, you talking to God won't help him. It'll help you. Amen. He's still God, whether you and I give him the time of day, whether we look his way, whether we acknowledge him about anything, whether we serve him, whether we pray to him, he's still God. Yeah. It helps us. It helps us. Adoration, confession, thanksgiving. Number four, supplication. Uh, supplication is intercession, request, petitions or desires, wants or needs expressed to the Father. 1 Timothy 2, 1. I will therefore that uh, men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubt. That's 1 Timothy 2, 8. But uh, 1 Timothy 2, 1. Uh, Paul said, I exhort therefore that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and for all that are in authority. That we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior who will have all men to be saved and to come into the knowledge of the truth. So in 1 Timothy 2, 1 to 3 there, he says that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercession. When you pray for somebody else, you're interceding for them. When you, and when you uh, pray for kings and for presidents and senators and congressmen and governors and mayors and people that are in authority, you are interceding for them. Intercessions. That's what Abraham did for Lot. Now in Solomon, remember Genesis 18? We went over it in our first, our first study. Genesis. He was interceding for Lot because Lot was in such a mess. His life was such a mess and his family that Uncle Abraham prayed, interceded for him. God, remember he said, if there's 50 righteous, will you spare it? If there's 40, 30, 20, he got, got, got them down to different numbers. He got down to 10. If there's 10 righteous, there wasn't even 10 righteous. Lot wasn't trying to win nobody to God in Sodom. He's trying to make money. <laughs> you, knew Lot, you knew who Lot was concerned about? Lot. There wasn't even 10 righteous in that city. Lot and his family, they weren't out witnessing, passing out tracts, inviting people to church, and trying to win souls. All right, they, He chose the well-watered land of Sodom, it says. He had other plans. But God, wasn't, God wasn't in his plans. You read the book of Genesis, you find several times where Abraham built an altar. We went over this. Four, probably four times at least. Abraham built an altar there. Abraham, he was constantly building altars. He was praying to God, seeking God for guidance in his life. Not one time do you find Lot building an altar in Genesis. You know why? Because Lot did what he thought he should do, whatever he thought he should do it, when he should do it, how he should do it, where he should do it, whatever. And look at his life. The last you hear about Lot... He's committing incest with his two daughters in a cave and he's drunk. There's a life of no prayer. I'm not saying that everybody don't pray will end up like that. I'm just saying that that's an that's a illustration of a man who basically just kind of did what he wanted to do. Regardless of what God said. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not into thine own understanding. Don't lean to your own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him acknowledge him. He wants us to acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. Proverbs 3, verse 5 and 6. He promises he will direct our paths. Say, God, what do you want me to do about this? It goes back to finding the Lord's will. What about this, God? 
I don't know if I should do this, Lord. I mean, you come to a certain decision that you say, part of you says, yeah, I want to do it. I think I should do it. I think it's God's will. And part of you says, no, I don't think it's God's will. you got to really seek God about it. Pray to God. But he says, uh, for kings and for all they're in authority. All right? That we may lead a quiet, peaceful life. So God does care who the president is. He does care who the governor is and who the mayors are. He does care. And uh, for kings and for all their authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty, this is for this good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. So God puts these in there. He must care about who, who is the president of the United States. These people that say, oh, I don't think it really matters who, you know, I heard, I heard people say, uh, someone told my wife one time, said, so, well, let me ask you, have your, does your, has your life in the last 40 years really changed whether a Republican or a Democrat was in office? I know it's changed in the last four years. Because <laughs> there three years ago, I was paying three or four dollars a gallon for gas. Four or five dollars close to and you go into a restaurant and, and try to eat, a, and you and your wife, you and your husband go out and take your kids out or whatever. You go to a restaurant, you've got to practically file bankruptcy when you get out of the place. $10 million to eat. It does matter in a lot of different areas. A lot of areas. Uh, some of the areas are discussed back there on that little paper back there on the table. What they, the candidates believe and what they don't believe. Uh, all right, so he said this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. All right, uh, so we're to pray, and uh, God wants us to pray. And Paul said in 2 Corinthians 1 11, he also helping together by prayer for us. So he's saying the Corinthian church helped him probably get out of the, the sentence of death that was in him. He said, we had the sentence of death in us in 2 Corinthians 1. And basically he's telling them, if it wasn't for your prayers, we might have died. You'd be surprised what your prayers do. Just pray. Pray for your lost love. You say, I know, but they act so rude and crude and filthy and perverted and they cuss and they, oh, I want to smack them right in the face. They just, oh, pray for them anyways. You'd be surprised what God can do. If you'd have seen me before I got saved, you would have, let me tell you. And I'm just telling you, God can change a man. He can change a woman. Amen. He can change a young person. I don't care. I don't care how they act. I don't care if they say, don't pray for me. I don't want your prayer. Don't you pray for me. I don't want you. I still pray for them. Matter of fact, I even pray for them more when they say that. Amen. All right. And uh, prayer is a weapon. That's the weapon you got. When you pray to God. All right. Uh, our prayer should be directed to God the Father in the name of Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. When to pray, always. Men ought to pray and not to faint. Men ought always to pray and not to faint. Jesus said in Luke 18, 1. Pray without ceasing, 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. We should have private prayer in a small secret place alone with God. We should have family prayer with a small group in our family. We should have public prayer before the church and the congregation. Where to pray? I will therefore that men pray everywhere, Paul said in 1 Timothy 2, 8. Pray everywhere. So these uh, government officials that try to tell us, well, you're not allowed to pray in this place, you're not allowed to pray here, you can't pray in the schools, you can't pray on the football field and all this kind of stuff. I mean, they, they're getting these coaches around the country. You hear about it on the news every once in a while. These coaches that are Christian men and trying to have a little short prayer before the football team, their football team goes out on the field and the ACLU and all these wicked, perverted, ungodly, filthy, uh, abominable organizations come in and try to say, you're not allowed to do that. But you're allowed to use four-letter words yeah. to your players and cuss them out. They don't think anything of that. There's no limitation on where to pray. Thank God there isn't. If prayer was confined to temples and churches and chapels by the wayside, you'd certainly be in a mess if you're in a burning, burning building or in a sinking ship. Prayer can be made everywhere at all times. Private prayer can be between you and the Lord anywhere. Family prayer is at home usually. 
Public prayer is like in the church or the temple. Two men went up into the temple to pray. Jesus said in Luke 18, verse 10. Luke 18, 10. Jesus Christ said, But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father, which is in secret. Matthew 6, 6. There has to be times, folks, on a daily basis, whether it's for a couple, three or four minutes, or 10 minutes, or 20 minutes, or whatever. There has to be some time each day. It's usually best in the morning when you're, you get up, you know, you get moving around a little bit, maybe get you a cup of coffee or whatever. You're, you're awake. And, uh, and before you start your day, because you say, well, I like to pray late at night. Well, that's the best time for you. Go ahead. But when late at night, I'm like this. <laughs> If I pray, try to pray, dear Lord, I pray for so and so, and I pray for. <laughs> that isn't the best time to pray. You do what you want to do. Best time to pray usually is in the morning. In the morning, you say, "How do you know that?" Well, a verse just comes to my head: Psalms five, three. Yep, Psalms five three. My voice shalt thou hear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning will I direct my prayer unto thee, and I will look up, will look up. <coughs> Psalms 5, 3. My voice shalt thou hear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning will I direct my prayer unto thee, and will look up. So that's usually the best time. you got to get alone, all right? You've got to get away from your wife. You've got to get away from your husband for a few minutes. They'll survive. you got to get away from your children, grandchildren, your uh, dogs, your cats, your parakeets, you know, everybody, and all the little animals and all that. And you got to get alone with the Lord so you can pray to God. All right. Uh, uh, men should pray everywhere and at any time, continuing instant in prayer. That means on the spot, continually. As the needs emerge at the time without wasting any time about it. That's very, very important. Because think about this. If you're not prayed up, you don't know when you're going to get a text or a phone call. Three in the afternoon or three in the morning. From a family member, a relative, church member, neighbor, kinfolk, whoever. Somebody on the job, at school, whatever it might be. Somebody's really, they're getting ready to die. You got to pray. Please pray. They were just in a bad accident. So, this happened. That happened. It could be one of a hundred things. This happened. That happened. And you don't want to have to say, well, okay, let me go in here and get right with God first. Because I really haven't been walking with God. Lord, I pray you forgive me of my sins. And you have to pray for a few minutes to get right with God before you can even pray for the situation. And by that time, the person might be dead or gotten worse. So you want to stay prayed up. Prayed up. Uh, so this is very important. All right. Uh, uh, okay. I know the atheists say, you know, they don't believe in God and all that. If you kicked an atheist out of a, plate, a plane at 2,000 feet, he would scream, oh my God, until he hit the ground. Like a fellow said, my grandfather was an atheist and my father was an atheist. And thank God I'm an atheist. Did you get that? Yeah. Thank God I'm an atheist. What do you mention about God? Uh, when Fatty Khrushchev came to the United States years ago, they called him. Somebody told him, God's with us. He said, God is with us too. Isn't that a fine thing for an atheist to say? An atheist was drowning one time and a preacher pulled him out of the water. When he got him out of the water, the preacher rebuked the atheist for his double standards and said, I heard you yelling and screaming, oh my God, while you were drowning. Why are you calling upon God when you don't believe in one? The man who was rescued said, well, there ought to be one for a fellow when he gets in a jam like that. Uh, I'll guarantee you that when the, the great Wallenda fell off his tightrope years ago and started downward. He was not praying, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. All right? When his body came hurling 130 feet down to that cement, people began to scatter underneath it. 
They weren't praying Hail Mary full of grace. All right, they were saying, oh God, please help. The prayer is instant on the spot. All right, and uh, when I fly to my meetings there, some, some of the meetings I drive to, some of the meetings I fly to through the last, I don't know how many years, but uh, 35 years, I guess, whatever. Uh, been flying for about 35 years. But uh, one of the things I do when I get on the airplane, I say, God, take all the curses off this plane Amen. and everything else. And I say, God, please get me to my destination. You know, if I have it, go to it's one city. Please get me there safely. And then I go from there to another city. Please get me to that city safely. I pray I have a safe flight there and back. I prayed every time I get on an airplane the last 35 years. And uh, so uh, God to bless the plane, I get home safely. He said, are you superstitious? No, I'm not superstitious. I just want to make sure there's no curses on that airplane and, uh, or anything else. All right, a, a person should be ready to pray anytime, any place, anywhere. That is, you ought to be on praying grounds. A person ought to at any moment be able to preach on the spot, a preacher, pray on the spot, or die on the spot. Amen. Preach, pray, or die on the spot. Or witness. The final prayer is, oh, usually people say, oh my God, help me, Lord. Oh God, please help me. Which is rapidly reduced to, oh God. Wasn't there a movie out here, George Burns or somebody, oh God, made a movie or something out? I wonder if that old boy ever got saved. He lived to be 100, didn't he? I mean, God give a, a man 100 years of life. Can you imagine him standing at the great white throne judgment? The Lord says, I gave you I gave you 100 years. I gave you a century. And you didn't get saved. Sister Lillian's gotten saved. Amen. Amen. Praise Amen. the Lord. She's going to live another hundred years, praise God. Amen. <laughs> she says she don't want to. Amen. All right. Uh, so uh, it's nothing to joke about. If you're in a car and, uh, you know, you get hit by a train or, you know, plane crashes or something, you know, and you're still alive or whatever, people, they cry out to God. In times of desperation, they cry out to God. All right. The Lord, in times of desperation, the Lord will hear a lot of strange voices that he never heard in a Wednesday night prayer meeting any place in town. You should be ready to pray on the spot. When Peter's caught on the spot and sinking in the water in Matthew 14, 30, he said, Lord, save me. We went over that in our verse by verse study. Lord, save me. That's a good prayer. He doesn't, you know, pull out a prayer book and go through all the different prayers. You don't have time for that. Just call out to God from your heart. All right, you should be on praying grounds anytime, anywhere, any place. Men ought to always to pray and not to faint. Luke eighteen one. David said he'd pray in the morning. I gave that verse, Psalms five three. My voice shalt thou hear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning will I direct my prayer unto thee, and will look up. At noon and evening he prayed. Evening and morning and at noon will I pray and cry aloud. He shall hear my voice. That's Psalms 55, 17. There are so many verses in the Bible about prayer. Psalms 55, 17. He prayed every day. It doesn't say he prayed five hours every time, but he prayed. Be merciful unto me, O Lord, for I cry unto thee daily. Psalms 86, 3. And not only in the daytime, but at nighttime. Psalms 88, 1. O Lord, God of my salvation, I have cried day and night before thee. Daniel prayed three times a day, according to Daniel 6.10. He was a busy man. He prayed three times. He was president over 120 provinces, it says in Daniel. Daniel had as much on his shoulders to take care of as probably a, a president of the United States. And he took times to, uh, time to pray three times a day. So we need to pray. You, you need to try to keep a prayer list. You say, why? Sit, sit there, look at my prayer list while I'm praying? Yeah, God don't care if you open up your eyes. He 
He ain't going to smack your face or nothing. All right, you have a prayer list. You pray for people. It reminds you. Uh, you have a long prayer list. Write down people. And uh, Dr. Don Green, he had a prayer list. He said he tried to go through that prayer list every single day of his life. He said it was hundreds of people. Now, he didn't pray, you know, 45 minutes for each person. But he mentioned their name in prayer. So, you know, that's what you got to do. If you feel like going on more detail to the Lord about it and sit person's situation, you can. Just however you feel that when you pray. You know, but pray for Bobby Bop and Bopper. You know, pray for their salvation. You know, pray for this one. Pray for that. Lord, deal with this. Pray and handle this situation, God. And just, I mean, just pray. Acknowledge God. All right. What is your prayer life like? Do you keep a record of God's answers to prayer? All right. Uh, you're I'm talking about your fellowship with the Lord when you talk to Him and He speaks to you through His Word. One time a little girl said to her daddy, she said, Daddy, is God dead? Daddy said, no, honey. She said, well, I just wondered. I don't hear you talking to him like you used to. <laughs> what are the subjects of prayer? All kinds of things. First of all, we ought to pray for the second coming of Christ. All right, even so, come Lord Jesus. The last prayer in the Bible is not for the gifts of the Spirit or not like that. The last prayer in the Bible is not for blessings, really. The last prayer in the Bible is not for anybody, really, to get the uh, baptism of the Holy Ghost and speak in tongues and or anybody get healed. The last prayer in the Bible is for Jesus Christ to come back. Revelation 22, verse 20. Even so come, Lord Jesus, John said. Even so come, Lord Jesus. We ought to pray to the Lord for our lives. We should pray for our daily bread for forgiveness of our sins, for guidance, for victory over temptation and sin. All these things are proper subjects of prayer. There's nothing wrong with praying for things either. All right, I, I mean, I wouldn't spend all my time just praying and God gives you a bunch of stuff. There's nothing wrong with praying. You, you know, there's certain things you want God to bless you with or you're asking God for. It. There's nothing wrong with that. But you don't always want to, you know, you have not because you ask not. You ask and receive not because you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your lust. James 4, 2 says in verse four, chapter 4, verse 2 and 3. All right, so you don't want to just constantly be asking things that you're, you know, you ask and miss that you may consume it upon your lust. Lord, give me a million dollars. Lord, give me 10 Cadillacs. Lord, give me this, give me that, give me this. I want this. I want a big yacht. You know, I want a vacation home in Europe. I want this. I give me that. Give me this. You know, I'm not sure God's really interested in all that. Uh, the idea... Uh, just pray, you know, pray for things that, you know, you need. You're supposed to pray for God to forgive you of your sins, for victory over temptation by the devil, for guidance. You're to pray for all men, as we mentioned earlier, 1 Timothy 2.1. You're to pray for a longer life, Isaiah 38, verse 1 to 3. I know we joke about it, but I want to live as long as God wants me to live. I want to live as long as God wants me to live. And uh, I don't want to do anything to hinder that, but I want to. I want to. I, I like to live. I like to live a long life. <clears throat> the, the strongest drive in a human being is to stay alive. Stay alive. Uh, Self-preservation. Second strongest drive in a human being is self-propagation. Uh, you're to pray for a longer life that you might be more useful and bear more fruit. You're to pray for personal safety, for the safety of others. Daniel, Daniel 6, verse 22 and 23, they prayed for safety. Uh, Daniel and David both were constantly praying for delivery from their enemies in the Bible. You're to pray for wisdom and understanding like Solomon prayed that in 1 Kings 3.9. Prayed for wisdom and understanding, 1 Kings 3.9. That if you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. James 1 5. So if we lack wisdom, we're to ask God, God, I don't really know about this situation. I lack wisdom on this situation. I really don't know what to do in this situation. Lord, whether you want me to do this or that. I mean, it could be any kind of decision. You've got to pray for wisdom in that in those situations. Because you want the will of God. If you lack wisdom, ask God for it. He said he upbraideth not. In other words, he doesn't hold back. He doesn't upbraid. He don't hold it back. He doesn't say, well, I don't know if I want to give you wisdom. How much wisdom do you want? You want that much? Oh, come on. He don't upbraid. He don't hold it back. 
Uh, you should pray for a prosperous journey like Paul prayed, Romans 1.10. You're to pray for clothing, shelter, food, and pray for the people you don't like. That's hard. It's hard on the flesh. But you know what that'll help you do? That'll help you to get victory over things. When you bless them that persecute you and curse you and everything else, when you do good to them that despitefully use you, Matthew 5, 44, and all that, you pray for them which despitefully use you, it'll help you in your Christian life. It'll help you when you take the high road. You don't do it just to show off or try to act spiritual in front of people. You honestly are doing it in your heart. You're honestly doing it in your heart. You take that high road and God knows it in your heart that you are. It'll give you victory over some things in your personal life. Uh, pray for your enemies, Matthew 5.44. Bless them that curse you, Matthew 5.44. Bless and curse not, Romans 12.14. I feel sorry for some of our politicians. I won't mention any of their names because there are several of them. But there's a bunch of them that it ain't going to be too long before they meet their maker. I'm not just talking about one or two. There's, there's several of them. And uh, they're not saved. I know that. I don't want nobody to burn in hell. I pray they get saved. Get born again. Uh, I don't want them to get reelected. <laughs> All right, there's a difference. There's a difference between reelected and going to hell. I pray for their salvation, but I don't. I don't want them getting back in office. Uh, Christians should pray. They should pray for the sick. James five fourteen. They should pray for people in authority. Their senators, congressmen, mayors, governors. I, I gave you the verse for that. First Timothy two one to four. They should pray for the salvation of sinners. For the Lord's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repent. 2 Peter 3, 9. God doesn't want anybody to burn in hell forever. But if they reject his son, they will. They should pray for, we should pray for immature Christians to grow up. Colossians 1.28, Paul was praying that every Christian may be made perfect in, Christ, in Jesus Christ and grow up to learn to live by faith and not by sight and get over uh, the carnal things of this world. Uh, they should pray uh, for their pastor and elders, bishops, those who are over them in the ministry. 1 Timothy 5.17, let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. Uh, they, they that preach the gospel should live in the gospel, 1 Corinthians 9, 14. It is the duty of the members of the congregation to pray for the leaders of the congregation. How to pray. We should be guided, first of all, by the Bible and our praying. Any praying that is not according to what God said is not the work of the Holy Spirit. It is the work of the unholy spirit. All right, I got about five minutes here. We should be guided by what the Bible says. We, should, we must pray with faith in the existence of God. The Bible says, but without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Hebrews 11.6. That verse is not to unsaved people. The whole chapter of Hebrews 11 is about saved people. Doing things by faith and through faith. But without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, that he's God, that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them. He'll reward you, of them that diligently seek him. You must believe that God rewards faithful intercession. He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So there must be persistence in prayer. The Lord Jesus gave us two great illustrations of this persistence in prayer which is sometimes called importunity. Luke 11, 1 to 13. Luke 11, 1 to 13. And Luke 18, 1 to 8. Luke 18, 1 to 8. The persistent knocker received the bread there in Luke. You must pray with humility. The Lord said, If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from the wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. That's why we have revival this week. 
All right, we're not just having five nights of meetings. Just oh, there's nothing else to do. It's it's October. It's a fall, and you know, I mean, a lot of money and preparation goes into this. All right, and uh, although we can come bodily to the throne of grace by the merits of Christ, Hebrews four sixteen, we don't come boldly in the sense of audaciously or arrogantly. You come boldly. In other words, in view of the fact that you know that God is God and that God has all power in heaven and earth and that God hears and answers your prayer. It's not an arrogant type thing, you know, a flippant type thing, a, a cocky, arrogant type thing. All right? We come boldly in the sense that we come in as sons of God who have a loving, kind, heavenly father as a member of a, of a, of a family. We don't have to go through the doorkeeper and the ambassadors and the secretaries <clears throat> and the vice secretaries and the bodyguards. We just walk up and they're in the front office. You can walk right up in the front office of Jesus. Amen. Let us come boldly into the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. You need grace to help in time of need. Amen. Hebrews 4.16. Brother Ralph, you know Brother Ralph, the Bible mobile guy, he asked my daughter-in-law, Grace, he said, how does it feel having your name in the Bible all the time? <laughs> right. Grace. We just walk in the front office. When we come to pray, we should confess our sins and judge them. Paul said, if we judge ourselves, we should not be judged. For when we are judged, we are chastened to the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. There's no way to have fellowship with God in prayer with unconfessed sin in your life. Known unconfessed sin in your life. You can't, you can't do it. You can't have fellowship with God. All right? What are, the, we, what are the conditions of prayer? First of all, we must pray in the will of God. Jesus prayed, not my will, but thine be done in Luke 22, 42. Of course, you cannot ever find the will of God unless you study your Bible. We've been going over that and find out what the will of God is from the word of God. Secondly, we must forgive others before God will hear and answer our prayers. Jesus said, when you stand, pray, forgive if you have God against any. I've talked to people through the years, and they told me, they said, Brother Kogel said, I had something against my brother or sister. They mentioned something, you know, but I'm not talking to anybody in this church, but uh, through the years and, and uh, out preaching and stuff, and they said, I had I had an awe against my brother or sister. I just couldn't stand them. I just, and they said, I get down to pray. Every time I get down to pray, that person's face would come up in my mind. And the Lord says, you need to forgive them. You need to forgive them. And uh, so you've got to forgive others. Thirdly, you must pray in faith, believing what things, whoever you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you shall have them. Mark 11, 24. Uh, James said in James 1, 6, and 7, but let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. He's not going to don't let him think he's going to receive anything of the Lord. He's wavering. The fourth condition is keeping the Lord's commandments. Uh, not only doing this, but those, doing those things that are pleasing in His sight. Uh, a lot of Christians have the funny idea that if they go to church and tithe and read their Bible, that they're obeying God. Well, you are obeying God if you do those things. But the condition for answered prayer, according to 1 John 3.22, is do those things that are pleasing in His sight. How can you expect answers to prayer when you know the things in your life that displease Him? All right. Other conditions for prayer are abiding in Christ and praying in Jesus' name. John 16, 24, Jesus said, As I close, Hitherto have ye asked nothing in my name, ask and ye shall receive, that your joy may be full. All right. Uh, is this on down here? All right. So uh, there, are some, some, there are some great prayer promises in the Bible. And... Uh, the most important part of this matter of prayer is what we call hindrances to prayer. Hindrances to prayer. We'll go over that uh, next time. And it uh, won't be this Wednesday night, but it'll be or Sunday night, but uh, next, <laughs> next Sunday night. So we'll go over uh, those things. All right? Are there any 